Oh, hello. How are you doing? I'm Eric Gerlach. You caught me mid-coffee sip there. And today we're going to have a talk about Empedocles and Greek philosophy. Empedocles, who supposedly tossed himself into a volcano to prove himself a god. Um, yeah, bunch of excitement with all of that, so let's get into it on this fine morning. So Empedocles was alive around 490 to 430, going backwards because other side of Jesus, as usual with the Greek philosophers, until we get to later Roman times. And he was from Agrigentum, a Greek colony in what is today the island, the Italian island of Sicily. As Sicily looks like a boot, uh, as Italy looks like a boot, and Sicily is the thing getting kicked uh, into the Mediterranean by Italy. You can talk to the Sicilians about that. Both Empedocles' father and Empedocles worked to overthrow the government of Agrigentum, which had grown abusive. They, Empedocles was said to have been a champion of the poor and an enemy of the oligarchs, the powerful who dominated politics. Like Heraclitus, he supposedly was offered the throne and he passed. He, which is often in these stories, possibly an analogy for choosing the mind over the body and the mental over the physical, somewhat, the wise over the simply given, etc., but something like that may have happened to the guy, and several of them. He was said to have visited Athens, as well as Babylon and Persia seeking knowledge, and his oratory skills, his rhetoric, his ability to speak, Confucius says, well, if this guy can speak well, if he isn't a good person, who cares if he can speak well? But Empedocles was said to be able to argue logic better than anybody. There is, of course, much difference between rhetoric and logic today. There wasn't so much in the ancient world, although people in India and Greece both knew and China, that speaking well isn't just everything. Aristotle called him the father of rhetoric, speaking of, and he had Pythagorean friends, and he definitely believed in reincarnation, like Pythagoreans, but possibly like a bunch of people of the Greek world. He was also said to be able to cure diseases as well as cure, <laughs> control storms. Cure storms, I'm not sure if the storm is hurting any. He could control storms like a wizard, like a Taoist who can control the weather somehow. Empedocles had a fantastic death, already mentioned. While some sources say he ascended into the heavens, others say he threw himself into a volcano, specifically Mount Etna in Sicily, to demonstrate that he had become godlike through a process of self-cleansing reincarnation. Perhaps he was trying to out deus ex machina, Anaxagoras. I forgot last time to mention Anaxagoras says no two things are split with an axe, which would mean no two things are entirely split with an Anaxagoras. I also forgot to make the joke about Euripides, Euripides, you uh, buying them. But what's the matter, you? And we have to keep going. I should have made those terrible jokes then, but I can make those terrible jokes now. So, Diogenes, so Empedocles split, not with an axe or an Anaxagoras, but with a volcano. Diogenes Laertius says Empedocles wanted to prove to the people of Agrigentum that he was a god or would be reborn a god, but the volcano spit back up one of his bronze sandals. I'd like to think with a burp, and you know, to show that Empedocles had been mortal and now was no more. Diogenes Laertius was clearly not a fan of Empedocles or his philosophy. Diogenes Laertius, again, being a, great, a Greek and Roman times who was a major biographer of the philosophers, of the Greek philosophers. A contemporary of Anaxagoras, Empedocles res is responding to him and the Eleatics, to Parmenides, who says non-being and motion and difference cannot be. So more of Empedocles' work survives than any other pre-Socratic philosopher. He was the last Greek philosopher to record his philosophy in verse as poetry rather than prose as long form. We almost don't use the word prose anymore because it just means normal writing stuff out that doesn't have verse or rhyme to it that's structuring it. But much of ancient thought in Egypt, Persia, Babylon, and Greece, early on especially, was done in lyric and done in poetry because it would be better to remember if you can't write it down. But stuff is increasingly being written down, so this is the last guy to do a bunch of poetry as his philosophy. Plato would continue, of course, to make art. He does bad plays that we'll talk about that are way better as philosophy texts than they are as plays, most of them. Symposium's all right, but we'll talk about that supposing the symposium at another time. You know, supposing we get there. So, 
Empedocles is familiar with the philosophical verses of Xenophanes and Parmenides, who both wrote poems and songs, essentially. If they're put to music, then a poem is a song. Empedocles wrote a poem on nature, which, if I had a dollar or a drachma for every ancient Greek philosopher or medieval Neoplatonist who wrote a work called On Nature or Nature, you'd basically have all of them, you know what I mean? Or all the drachmas or something. Or we'd have at least six bucks by now because, yeah, everybody and their mother writes a book. What's this book on? Oh, it's called On Stuff. It's called On Being. It's called Nature and Stuff. You know, like being, time, etc. I don't know. Stuff. You know, things and larger picture of things, stuff, life, good, bad, up, down, with Archilochos. Yes, yes, poets, you know, they are, again, our social betters, as we know. In the very beginning uh, of this poem, we only have the first part called Purifications, which is nice and religious. It's like the vestibule in the beginning, in the, in the uh, entry of the Catholic Church. In the very beginning, Empedocles says he is no longer mortal, but now immortal, and walks among mortals as a god, praised and decked with flower garlands wherever he goes, curing diseases and raising the dead. This may sound a bit like Jesus, and it is a bit like Jesus, actually. He seems to have a lot of the same magical powers and miraculous abilities, and uh, the New Testament is written in Greek, and Jesus makes a lot of puns in Greek. Some have suspected perhaps there's something here. Some people have gone out on a limb. Ah, Jesus was really this guy. Whenever people say this guy was really that guy, I almost always distrust it. The reason is because there's been enough people, and people are similar, so people have, it's much likelier, it seems to me, I can't prove this, much likelier that people's legends are blended together, and their stories stories in their lives and the legends told and stories of them than it is that they're like Lao Tzu maybe three guys who founded Taoism and one guy then had two other legends blended into him it's much more likely that there's several people and then things get attributed to the wrong people all uh, amalgamated and gathered than it is that there was no Jesus this was Jesus it was a you know something yeah I don't believe that. Um, and there's a lot of those that comes up in the history of ancient thought, trying to show there's more than one person or not. And a lot of times it's like, well, why show that there's not more than one person if they say there's more than one person? You know, there's also a random point I have to say. You can hear the subtle sounds of a cat eating food. Tender crunching in the background, yeah? The, uh, th I work at a library where there's texts by the guy from Japan, I am forgetting exactly his name, begins with an A, um, who uh, did the Tokyo gas attack. He also himself in his works, uh, the who thought he was the living Buddha and Jesus, come again. And he says in his works, I've read some of his work, the, I forget his name. He says, I am the Christ. And how do I know that? Well, because only the Christ would tell you he's the Christ. And hey, I'm, I'm, I'm that kind of guy. And he starts with that as an opening as kind of, as a cult leader. Culture is the cult, man. And yeah, I grew his hair out long, says only Jesus would tell you he's Jesus. Hey, I'm Jesus. And this guy right here, of course, in Pedicles is like, look, I'm a God. I'm telling you, you know what I mean? I mean, why would I tell you that? Let me tell you. It's again, Jesus kind of balks a little bit at being like, I'm the whoever, eh, we're all sons and daughters of God, you know? I mean, it's, uh, hey, why are you talking about me? But Empedocles is really like, I am a golden God. You know, honestly, he seems a little less modest than what you got in the Gospels, you know? But hey, uh, that's a newer testament than this, of course, by at least uh, 500 at least years. So Empedocles is said to have believed that the souls of all things, before inhabiting things, as Thales originally said, were in a state of bliss, like some sort of uh, enlightenment, some kind of pure state of the Jains and Buddhas, before committing an unnamed crime. Now, what does this sound like? This is going to sound like something very particular many people are aware of who are his, uh, familiar with modern religious movements. That there was some sort of fall from grace into the mortal bodies of plants, animals, and humans. This also involves a volcano. Uh, you may start recognizing something like Scientology a little in this. Uh, through more morality and through living a good life, we can become gods again, as Empedocles may have believed he had achieved. This sounds strangely, again, a bit like Scientology. Honestly, they have their own beliefs. I have no interest in chasing them down or what have you. Um... 
I am interested in the interconnections of human cultures and beliefs. I do know that folks study Greek philosophy, and then they often study Greek philosophy and say, this is the cosmic thing, the Egyptian thing. I come from the Haight-Ashbury. Sometimes when people tell you it's the Greek thing, it's the, Egy- it's the Egyptian thing, it's the cosmic thing, sometimes they're pulling things from Greek texts and saying, ah, because it's a brilliant idea. I do have my suspicions about this or that thinker pulling this or that idea from Greeks and then saying, ah, no, this is the ancient truth. Not that other cultures aren't amazing. It's that Anglo, uh, well, uh, Europeans and particularly Anglophonic folks like myself who speak English and are out here in America, they would often think of the Greeks, not Indian or Chinese philosophers. Uh, hopefully we increasingly do out here in California. So Empedocles argues that the four elements, fire, air, earth, and water are the roots of all matter. They are unborn and undying. Empedocles identifies fire with Zeus, air with Hera, wife and sister, you of Zeus, goddess of women, marriage and getting pissed at Zeus for running after everything with a set of legs, water with Persephone, notice uh, Persephone and Hades are here, who Empedocles calls Nestis, a daughter of Zeus. That sounds a bit Egyptian. Uh, queen of the underworld and goddess of vegeta- vegetation. Vegetation. Uh, it's like meditation with vegetables. Um, when you vegetate and meditate, it is vegetation. Vegetation and springtime. And then earth as the fourth element with Hades. Hades, actually, we sort of identify that nowadays people think Satan and hell. Hades was very much just earth god, gets together with the other gods to defeat titans and other stuff. It's just sort of earth deep, earth god, and it's sort of bad to be underground and dead, but that's not like hell necessarily, as opposed to kind of boring and terrible. I suppose it is often presented as. So it isn't really the um, Abrahamic later stage kind of uh, more somewhat Zoroastrian kind of hell, polar opposite Manichaean sort of thing. Notice the identity of gods with basic elements. And all of this would be quite orthodox along Homeric lines, uh, except, and Empedocles also calls Hades Aedoneus, king of the underworld. Um, except, Hesiod, uh, for Hesiod, it's Poseidon, who's the king of water, and Zeus, king of air, not fire, it seems. Again, that's debatable, but it seems that way to me. I am somebody who does say you can find in ancient myths a lot of proto-science, or early science, if we want to call it science, what they're doing in Sumer, Egypt, and Greece. I do, and say it's early proto-science, if that language fits better. And so, yes, you can see here a very explicit identity of gods with specific elements as a kind of periodic sort of understanding. Hesiod does not hold that Hades is uh, Lord of Earth. According to Hesiod, the three of Poseidon, Zeus, and Hesiod join forces to defeat the Titans and take over the cosmos. So Empedocles, in a Pythagorean gathering that departs from Hesiod, has fire, upper male, air, has fire, upper male, air, upper female, earth, lower male, and water, lower female, as opposed to a pair, as an opposed pair of kings and queens. I happen to have theories about Lewis Carroll. I do think that Lewis Carroll is teaching people Aristotle. I've come out with some work on the categories backwards as the order of events in Wonderland and the Looking Glass. And I do think the kings and queens of the Looking Glass, like the uh, Duchess, White Rabbit, and the King and Queen of Hearts, that those are parts of the square of opposition. And it's interesting here, just random uh, connection, that you have a square of kings and queens being a kind of uh, square of opposition, but not Aristotle's logic here. And Aristotle himself probably did not use the square of opposition, but thought in terms of opposition, much like a square. Uh, We don't know that he used the square for that. So... The, like earlier philosophers, but unlike Hesiod, the gods are unborn as well as undying. So Hesiod uh, does say the gods are born, and I mentioned with other lectures, the gods being born but not dying is a problem physically. It's a physics problem. How do you have something uh, born? It should be unborn, and Heraclitus does say, well, the gods are not born. Um, The Empedocles places fire as king on top. Fire, air, earth, and water are called the four classic substances today. They were accepted by Plato and Aristotle, very much from Empedocles and others, and with them the physics of European Christians and Middle Eastern Muslims. Chinese uh, often add in metal, 
There's other ways that systems are somewhat different. You can find similar systems in Hawaii, and then it is difficult to know what the Hawaiians came up with on their own orally, and then uh, after that, texts and different cultures are coming into Hawaii, such that I have a book or two on Hawaiian mystical systems. And those books, again, like a lot of stuff, unfortunately, it's difficult to disentangle them from Pythagoreanism because a lot of people who come along, the Hawaiians aren't literate, which is perfectly rational and logical in their place and time as a tribe. And then it's difficult to know how much is Pythagorean, but it does appear Hawaiians have similar systems because, of course, why wouldn't they have earth and water and then do things with types of earth and types of water as solids, fluids, gas, uh, liquids, gases, fluids, I suppose, um, with air and uh, with air and waters, airs and waters, which is why smoke as a bunch of earth gets all mixed up with fire and goes upward uh, like fire tries to go upward again, um, interpretational interpretive dance with fire, water, sad. Um, yes. Sad like Eeyore. The, uh, for thousands of years, a lot of people followed this formula. Uh, and it was only in 1772. It isn't just the Greeks as opposed to Egyptians and Persians who were bringing us all this, but it was only in 1772. Empedocles plays a role here in the, finally, the Swedish chemist Carl Wilhelm Scheele, Scheele was attempting to prove him right or something like it. And he accidentally split air into uh, what seemed like air and fire air, which turns out to be oxygen. He called it fiery air in fake Greek Latin, which I don't have here. But oxygen, um, oh, I'm going to forget what this means. Acid burning. Um, there's a, The word oxygen means the way it interacts, unlike hydrogen, which produces water. Uh, oxygen produces something else. This is not a chemistry class, again. But it could be a proto-chemistry class, and then you take chemistry classes and know things. So for Empedocles, love and strife are the two forces that order the cosmos. Like gravity is love, and anti-gravity is hate. The Buddhists say when you do math problems or anything, there's a little bit of love, a little bit of hate, and being like two plus three equals five, and then it feels that it fits. I actually am crazy enough to believe that. Not that love and hate are actually necessarily the physics forces of strong and weak forces. Let's say hate is a weak force. Love is a strong force in physics. I'm not saying that necessarily because I think human emotions are physical social processes we have, and meaning is a physical social process. So I don't know how much the universe loves or hates itself or needs to, and I don't need to believe that human emotions like love and hate are the meaning of the universe, and it needs to be. We can remain agnostic about all of that and say, however, that something like a math problem or something like you agreeing with me or Empedocles, now that kind of physics or math does have to feel it fits in or and has to be emotional in order for you it to be meaningful to you and for you to understand it, for with Wittgenstein for it to feel like it fits, and then with Wittgenstein to feel like you can go on. So... Yeah, in a certain sense, nailing down the elements like this, feeling like this fits, whether or not it's full of gods, thales, and chess pieces, and then it feels like it fits and we do and don't feed and house people. All of that feels and doesn't feels like it fits with all the feels. So, we have love and strife, which again is his gravity in essence. Again, Einstein didn't really like Newton's gravity, but we didn't do better and neither did he, so we still have it. So, hey, you know, other explanations. So, strife gained an influence. At first, love was holding everything together as a sphere in the center, but then, and chaos was outside. Here we have God floating over the waters of chaos. Why are there waters of chaos? All uh, Zervanite, Zoroastrian, floating apart from each other, if all is good. Then strife gains an influence from the outside. It kicks in like Ahriman, like sort of Satan, is sort of outsider art. Uh, entirely. Not enough to disintegrate the sphere, but enough to cause the initial separation into, guess what, the cosmos and the planets and how they move around in circles-ish, ellipses, etc., gesundheit. And yes, that all of the elements stratify and we can see physics and chemistry the way we do because love somewhat gave in to hate and was so rattled. Again, we're through October we're in October right now. Um, and they, the cosmos got so rattled, so triggered, and basically strife entered into love, and then that's why the planets go round and aren't perfect spheres all interconnected or something like that. Also why human events look like they do, because there's some hate all mixed up in the love. Again, I'm from the hate, and there's a lot of love there, still, in spite of the yuppies, which was, well, it was the 80s. But yes, the it's a bit similar to Kalpas of Indian thought. A lot of 
The Mayans have the Mayan calendar with uh, somewhat the sun, I believe, grasping hearts in, like, claws and clutches. There is something like love and pain in the circle of time in the Mayan calendar. You can find a lot of people understanding humanity in terms of love and hate holding the community together and thus the cosmos. And you are welcome to think about that. What you like, I think about it as I do. So... As the world mixed and stratified, this stuff gets fun. Like the Timaeus of Platus, there of Platus, Platus, Plato. I don't know if that's Latin or not, Platus, but yes. That there's a lot of interesting stuff here that turns out uh, that you find repeated in lots of weird stuff in Europe, uh, Islam, etc. So Empedocles says there are cases of human arms and heads, speaking of the symposium, supposedly, uh, that unjoined to bodies. There's arms and heads wandering around. This is his evolutionary theory. And monsters of various sorts, part animal and part human, like centaurs, like Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, and like Plato, who borrows from both as well as Empedocles. The form of the human is pre-designed and latent, waiting for the cosmos to find and figure it out and put the human parts together. The historian Herodotus believed there were dog-headed people and cyclops, one-eyed people, possibly living in India. Think about the dot in the head um, of Hindus. Explaining the various monsters encountered by Odysseus on his odyssey. That possibly Odysseus was cruising the coast of India, possibly. Don't know. Um, it would have taken him a little while to get over there, though. Uh, but again, it's weirdly almost like that's what was going on. But again, I don't think the, uh, well, yeah, you can, uh, the oceanography doesn't work out entirely with the Pythagoreanism there. Empedocles' physics explains the Homeric monsters of traditional mythology. He is trying to explain why are there cyclops. Okay, well, here, and then there's spheres, and then here are the planets. He's trying to explain what he understands of his culture. Empedocles argues human beings were pr formed from pre-human dual beings of both genders. All of this sounds extraordinarily like the symposium, uh, was some of the theory that's proposed at the symposium. Much as the gods and goddesses were undifferentiated in it, the pure unmixed. Aristophanes in the symposium is a playwright and a character is that he is the guy who was lowered uh, his own, who lowered his own Euripides Again, Euripides, you buy him, as a character in the scene to mock the overuse of Deus Ex Machina. Um, and he says that they were separated by Zeus, which is why heterosexual men and women find completion in each other, and gay and lesbian people find completion in each other. Which, again, a lot of people would say is overtly, oh, homosexuality is totally fine in Greece. There's ways where he might be speaking tongue-in-cheek that everybody understood him, and yet it was still weirdly, like, not totally accepted. Again... Uh, homosexuality in ancient Greece is not my specialty, but again, he had, uh, definitely um, Aristophanes seems to say, uh, he weirdly say, seems to say um, men who are into men are our solar betters. So that certainly isn't the way we run society today. And again, that would be very odd. And he's drunk at the time, and he's not portrayed as totally reliable, and he's speaking artfully. So yeah. Um, it isn't really true. It's again, as always mentioned, just trying to fill in the, you know, uh, the areas and the understanding given our own understandings. I don't think it was totally legal for men to just live with men as husband and husband, but at the same time, he does definitely here is one of the places in Greek culture where it seems like he seems to be saying being gay is awesome. Um, but, and being lesbian, he's like, they're, uh, lesbians are our moon, you know, our silver lunar betters. And again, um, I could probably find a coven in Berserkly Town, this town, you know, which and which I could learn from my uh, silver, uh, my silver cistern. Um, but yes, I will find time to do that later. So, Buddhist thought also endorses the idea that all binding union again is uh, is something. And I do think psychology is still telling us the relationships between emotion, love, hate, and how we do math and how we talk. And how meaning works, which is a lot of what I like to study. And I love ranting about this kind of stuff and, and considering the history of it because that's how I do this. So for Empedocles, like the Pythagoreans, souls reincarnate and plants, animals, and humans are linked in chains of life. It's the circle. Yes, I'd belt it out. I won't with the, uh, with the African opening. I want to. I won't. I will spare us all. Again, I will rather throw myself into a volcano, I'll show myself out, you know? And then, yes. So, 
as Empedocles was about to become immortal in the next life, having made up for his sins, uh, he says that he had been... He had eaten meat decades ago in a previous life and been banished to the animal kingdom for eating meat where they eat animals. So how's he going to get out of that? But as Empedocles was about to become immortal, he made up for his sins and had gone through the cycles of reincarnation being super vegan, I suppose. If so, he believed he would be reborn a god after emerging from the volcano. This, again, is a little bit conflicting here. Does he say he's a golden god, or is he like, I'm going to become one? So, one Roman source says that he was reborn from the volcano, shot into the heavens, and now lives on the moon, possibly with uh, Sappho and lesbians, subsisting on dew. He is doing the dew. You know, it's again, probably a mountainous dew on the moon. If true, this would confirm the theory of Anaxagoras that the moon is inhabited. Similarly, Empedocles was a critic of animal sacrifice to the gods, sort of like Jesus, um, where he's like, knock off with the doves, you jerks, you know, in the temple, which he believed, uh, Empedocles believed, was human sacrifice, and there are... Definitely in India, Greece, and China, there are folks mentioning, yeah, killing the animals, you know, and the animal sacrifice where we kill animals, we eat them, and then we also kill some animals, lovingly give that back to the earth, say, hey, thanks, earth, as a partner in all of this. Increasingly, it's like, you know, this is inhumane, because actually, and for Empedocles, because of reincarnation and because you're killing people, much like Pythagoras, and Empedocles had Pythagorean friends, supposedly said, stop beating that dog, I hear the voice of my friend. You can beat that other dog, though, that's not my friend, I hate that guy, you know? Hey, I bet. I hate that guy. Um, men in tights and all of that. I do love Mel Brooks. Again, hopefully the children know where Family Guy comes from and all of that. The uh, So, uh, he says that in the glorious past, before the strife of his own day, people were wiser and gave the gods offerings of honey and grain, knowing well that reincarnation would bring terrible rebirths on those ignorant of reincarnation. So we're just by killing animals, we're holding the, we're bringing the whole community down reincarnation style. We're just all getting reborn cockroaches here, folks. Similar to Anaxagoras, and Empedocles warns, uh, argues, uh, always like this little weird addendum, a warm uterus produces a male child and a cool uterus, cool chilling uterus, produces a female. This explains why males are larger, darker in skin, and hairier. Again, you can ask, uh, well, you can ask labor, you know, to deliver you a better theory uh, than all of that. I'm not going to labor anymore on, you know, on any of the delivery there. Empedocles argued that light emerges from our eyes, presumably from the fire of the mind in the head, which is all in here. You can close your eyes, think of uh, anything you like, and see light. Uh, so we see things and it touches things, the light in the mind and the fire in the mind such that we can see them. For thousands of years, this seems to have been the explanation, not that everybody bought him and listened to him, but people believed something like that and because of him and others, until Avicenna, possibly, one of the first, the uh, first to be recorded I know of, the Islamic philosopher and doctor, possibly the most important of Islamic philosophers ever, Avicenna is still often not in spell check in modern systems, I have to say, nor is Ibn Sina, his, his name, um, his Arabic name, which again, which he's one of the most important thinkers in world history. Every time I switch computers, WordPress and other stuff, like just keep screwing up those names, I got to tell you, like, and that's googly, that's everything. Wikipedia can be trusted with all of this uh, decently uh, with the spellings and all of the folks. But again, the spell check in modern systems can't be, I got to say, after all these years. I've been doing this for 14 years, you know? Um, every time I switch computers, go to a different place with all this. Names not in spell check. Greek names all are, though. Like, that's good. The Islamic philosopher and doctor Avicenna demonstrated that light comes into the eye but not out of the eye around 1000 BCE, which is probably why we can't see in the dark like a, you know, like a cat, which still a cat does not have light in their head that shoots out like lasers, although Laser Cats is an intriguing band name and or graphic novel idea. Avicenna questioned Empedocles' theory, saying, well, yeah, why don't we all see in the dark? Well, okay, let's look at this, this, and this. Uh, the Chinese, Muslims, and then 
uh, Italian Renaissance and others are learning to experiment, to set things up, not just observe, but increasing experimentation, which adds into the modernity of science, such that we now proactively experiment rather than just watch clouds sit with apes, day 73. Um, and yes, that that is, that he is, a, he showed through some experimentation. Well, check it out. You know, why would you see in the dark if light comes into the eye? One of the first to suggest that, that we know of in print. So Empedocles argues we learn about things through perception, light coming into the uh, back into the eyes for Avicenna, but we can only see one side of things at a time. With thought, we can put together the various sides of things to see them as they fully are. Barclay, for whom the town I'm in was named and mispronounced, he says when you imagine an apple, do you see it from the inside or all sides? No, you see it as if you're looking at an apple on a shelf from a short distance away like you're going to interact with it. So just thinking of an apple in the abstract is not seeing it objectively completely. It's seeing it as the often subjective perspective from which you would see the apple, which is how your mind would most often, not necessarily always, represent it. Because that's how you'd need to imagine it, so simply. As a human eyes would see it from one side, not all sides. We could be trained, as Wittgenstein would say, we could keep the window open here, be trained to see an apple from all sides imaginatively. We don't search inner murals of apples for answers yet, uh, which suggests something. Doesn't prove something, but highly suggests how we think. So, as Her much as Heraclitus says about wisdom, which sees beyond the divisions of things by experts, Empedocles says it's the job of philosophy to integrate things into wholes rather than merely carve them into parts. It corresponds to his cosmology because love is trying to overcome hate and the strife and the divisions of things, trying to bring things lovingly, group hug, mentally everyone, into big crunch, which is kind of sort of big love hug crunch, and then possibly world reborn again through strife and problems. Not, uh, not sure here, clear. As far as Empedocles, the Mayans and Aztecs seem to think that things cycle like the Indian folks do. It's more Abrahamic to think this is the midpoint of what is the only cycle in series, and then it ends, and what? And to be, well, not so agnostic to say that's the final end if we're being, uh, well, rather Manichaean about it. So the French philosopher Badiou has actually argued a similar thing, um, that wisdom, like philosophy, is putting things together beyond their parts. So many would say, for instance, a lot of people say philosophy is not very useful as much as science. Uh, that's fine if you are doing a bunch of chemistry. I wouldn't necessarily listen to philosophers like me or folks who go off about philosophy. Technically, one should never call oneself a philosopher. That's like calling oneself wise. That's sort of, yes, I don't know, you know, uh, one shouldn't really praise oneself in such ways. But folks who are doing philosophy and could be called philosophers or not, like Badiou, who's also, I believe, a sociologist, that if you like science, okay, but how is science political? And how is politics scientific? And how is politics religious? And how is science religious? And how is religion, how has religion been scientific the whole time? Plenty. That's a lot of this Greek cosmology with polytheism to monotheism. Well, it's philosophical in the way we use words. It's wise to take a historical psychological perspective, as Sluga would say, from berserkly Barkley land. And we would basically say, well... We can, and it's very Wittgensteinian, which is what I like, Sluga likes, folks like. Badiou may or may not be uh, into Wittgenstein. Uh, he could get that through French thought, though. It is very Buddhistic, Wittgensteinian, etc., to say that it's a philosophical question to ask how scientific politics is or how religious politics is or not. And Hume says we can pivot those ways, and it was wise for the peasants to do so in the Middle Ages, to pivot with and against religion with politics and the local lords or not and get with and for, at for and against the bishops, against the local lords when they're mistreated. So it's philosophical to sit back and say, but I can consider science and its relationship to religion and its relationship to politics, regardless of what I think. I am very anti-positivism that way, quite openly. I do not think that people should say we're doing a lot of science, therefore good, because I know ways of easily tripping up that, because it's like, but do you know how good we're doing with science and why and for who? Without any debate about vaccines being valid, I think it's quite clear that people aren't very aware of how we or the Soviet Union use science. So asking how political or religious we are or aren't in being scientific, artistic, political, all of these are good, wise questions for philosophy. Empedocles is saying something about, like Barclay says, we put together 
perspective on the apple via wisdom, knowledge, but then the wiser perspective of the angles on the knowledge and the knowledges of the apple put together. Similarly, a later Frenchman like Badiou would say that knowledge is a social product and construct. So asking how historical science has been or how political it has been is for a history of science class or a philosophy of science class. And unfortunately, I like Feyerabend and he argues in Against Method from 1975, almost nobody, philosophers and scientists, take a history of science class or a philosophy of science class. You might think the textbook is history of science. Technically, the textbook is most often some kind of phone that is ringing. Yes, most often the ways that we are pulled this way and that way from various directions. Um, it can add up together such that very few people take a philosophy of science or a history of science class. Probably science majors are about done with science classes at that point and need something else in their life also and much love and happiness. And I don't think folks in the scientists, sciences are treated very well or funded rightly um, by all of that. So asking how science is political or how we are religious when we're political or not, or how scientific we are or are not when we're political, or whether or not politics is showing us science well or why, for who, all of these are important questions that I think we can use philosophy and wisdom to answer. And Empedocles here is saying something about wisdom that you can find in later French thought, like with Badieu and postmodernism, which isn't very scary as much as it is not out absolute scientific uh, science denial, but understanding that we all rely on science, we all very much believe in science, even evangelicals uh, who don't like evolution, etc. And that these things are intertangled in our lives and we can use wisdom to see many angles on all of this. I'm a very big fan of saying all of that. And I don't ever wish to be perceived as an anti-science person. We clearly need better funded, more publicly supported, and publicly uh, science for the public good. I think is very clearly what we need. I don't like 10 cities growing and people talking about logic, reason, and science a lot. I think that's rather silly. Um, and I think that that's because people often trust religious figures, scientific figures, academic figures, and others to do their thinking for them rather than realize thinking is a continuous process. If you want to be, uh, think for instance, in Norway, people use sci uh, there were science shops where people use science directly for people's problems in their lives, and you can go have science directly help you with your life. We don't fund science in that way. So how are things political? How is knowledge political? How are you seeing one side of the apple rather than all of them? This is philosophy, and philosophy, like thought, is continuously part of science, part of art, part of religion, is continuously important as the depth of thought, one could say itself. And part of the depth of thought itself, very much here, to pa uh, having paused on this idea, is very much about asking questions about authority in one's life and what they are doing from the wider picture, and then they force feed you hemlock after the youth revolt or something like that. So yeah, if you can afford it in this economy, afford the hemlock, as we'll talk about. So that said... I have more rants that are somewhat philosophy of science about all that, because I do believe in a critical philosophy of science that is supporting of distributing vaccines to people, and that's very much me. So I'll leave off on that. Next semester, I'm going to be able to rant on Feyerabend and philosophy of science a bit more. If you are interested in philosophy of science, I will be doing modern European philosophy next semester, and I will have a couple of rants about positivism, pragmatism, and philosophy of science from various sides. But here we can end Empedocles, which is a shorter subject and lecture. We got about 40 minutes in on this. There's longer on other subjects. Is that he is saying wisdom shows us various sides of things and all is bound together somewhat by love. All of that regardless of how much it sounds like Jesus, is very also Socrates. Socrates says love, he was taught by women, Diatima um, and others, uh, mistress of Pericles. Um, is it? No, Diatima, uh, that's Aspasia. Aspasia is the mistress of Pericles. Diatima is the witch shaman priestess, something or other, um, who he learned from women that love is at the center of the cosmos. So apparently he didn't learn that from Empedocles. So much happiness, much love at the center of your cosmos. And, uh, well, yes, have a wonderful, loving day in your cosmos.